Uh, I asked you guys on Facebook for a couple of questions you guys have delivered. So we're going to go over some uh, DaVinci Resolve fusion questions-ish stuff. And uh, yeah, so let's just do that. Explore a wide selection of pre-made creative tools for DaVinci Resolve, like titles, transitions, slideshows and infographs, like bar charts and callouts, and much, much more. Link in the description for more information. So the first question is asking about how to reorder plugins on the Fairlight page, as well as exporting in 4K with a ratio of two to one. The exporting, it's pretty simple. You can kind of export in DaVinci Resolve in any resolution. Uh, the only thing that you would want to do is probably duplicate your timeline and then change that new timeline to what you want to deliver as so that you can make sure that framing is all done correctly. And then once you go to deliver page on that new timeline, you should have the option to export in whatever frame rate that that timeline's on. Fairlight and plugins. So I played around with this a little bit and you're actually right. There isn't any way to go in here and to switch them up besides deleting them and then just making sure that they come in correctly. I don't know why, but yeah, that is interesting. All right, so the next one is talking about a Wacom tablet, and I definitely use one. I don't use it as much anymore. I used to use it a lot when I was on the color page, so when I would be making all of my power windows around different objects, uh, using a pen is definitely nice, and to be honest, I just used it as if it was a mouse. So there wasn't anything extra that I remember. The one cool thing is that in Fusion, there are some things within Fusion that also use the sensitivity of your pen. So you can like draw on different things and make like the thickness based on the pressure of your pen. So that's kind of cool. I did a whole video on drawing on individual frames. There is a bunch of videos that have that kind of look where you're like scribbling on the frame and uh, using a pen is cool because you can, you know, set the pressure and depending on how hard you push, it depends on how thick the line is, which is actually pretty cool. But yeah, I just use it just like a uh, mouse. Why do I use DaVinci Resolve as my NLE? Um, to be honest with you, the majority of NLEs are going to enable you to get the same end result. It's just that they're all slightly different. My way into getting into DaVinci Resolve actually started with me being all Adobe based and I did my color grading in a program called SpeedGrade. But then Adobe actually discontinued SpeedGrade and I wanted to find something else that was a color tool, there wasn't many options that weren't ridiculous money. There are a couple of other options out there when you get into uh, color grading and stuff like that, but they're extremely expensive. Uh, and DaVinci Resolve was acquired by Blackmagic and after a couple iterations, it ended up coming out with a free version. And I gave that a try and that was actually a lot of fun. At that time, it didn't have anything in it other than the ability to bring something in, color it, and then export. As time went on, they started adding in all of their other tools, which is, you know, everything that you see along the bottom. And I had a Adobe suite, and then they kind of switched to a subscription model. And I was also looking for other tools. But at that time, um, DaVinci Resolve's edit page wasn't really um, up to snuff. So I ended up sticking with Adobe for a little while and I actually ended up getting free licenses of Adobe through Adobe because I sell stock footage. So that kind of held me over for a little bit. And then when the uh, uh, Resolve like suite came, became a bit better or Resolve program, whatever, when that became a bit better, then I started to uh, use it more and more for editing and then, you know, they just started going crazy with adding a bunch of stuff into it, which kind of, you know, has me where I'm at today, where I don't have to do like round tripping like I used to have to do with the standalone fusion. <laughs> it's another plus, another win. So, yeah, that's kind of why I use it. So my next question is asking about using multiple power windows and how to get them to overlap and work together. So I can quickly just show you that if we come over to the color page. And let's say in here, I 
first grab a power window, right? And let's ramp that up. And I want to add in another one. So you have the selection here, right? But if you ever need to add more, you can just click any of these buttons and keep adding as many as you want. So if I add in another one, I can then get one over here, right? So now they're overlapping and they're working together. Um, now, if you wanted them, you could have them work together or you could have them work against each other. And that's where you would come down here where you have these two little guys here. One is going to combine and then the other is going to cut out. So if I go like this, we're now using it as a negative, right? So now this particular one, we're doing everything on the outside of it. But if I click this here, I can then cut into the current masks that are there. So I could come into here. Oh, let's turn it back on, but let's come in the power windows. I can now cut uh, one into another. So I could do that too. So one will take the uh, mask and flip it. So it's the opposite. So instead of the inside the circle, it's outside the circle. Or we could uh, use this one, which then it'll take whatever masks are currently there and do the opposite of that. So the next one is talking about color spaces and doing color space transforms from one color space to another one accurately. Uh, it really depends on how your timeline set up. If everything on your timeline, every element on your timeline, every single thing on your timeline is in one color space and you want to go to another one, you would use color uh, management with that's in this little gear down here. You come into here and you go into color management and then right in here you would say what your input is and what you want your output to be and then on the timeline as well. So that's where I would go. If you're looking to have multiple different things on your timeline that are in different color spaces and you have like a group of images or videos that need to go from one color space to another one, what you're going to want to do is create nodes on those on the color page. You're going to create nodes and then use what's called a color space transform. And that will just say, okay, this is my current color space and I want to go into this color space. And it'll do all the math for you within that one node so that down the pipe of the nodes that you're working on, it'll all be in whatever color space you want the output to be. So that's how you would do it, depending on which one um, you want to go with. What methods do I use for denoising on the free version? There are a couple of open effects, but the thing with open effects is that they work in a lot of high end programs. So they typically have that high end price tag to go with them. Um, and a lot of the uh, choices that I would give you are going to cost equal price to a license of DaVinci Resolve. So I personally don't have one for you um, that I've used and that I would personally recommend. There might be something out there that someone else has used in the past, but I personally can't you know, recommend one. How to replace a background of a video with a picture or a color background? Uh, it really depends on what this background is. Are we talking about like something that we can chroma key out? A solid color like a green or a blue? Because uh, we can chroma key it. You can chroma key any color, but you're going to typically want to stay away from skin colors. So that's why you see blue or uh, green screens. Or is it a tree behind you? Uh, it would really depend on how you're going to do it. So if it's just the solid, you would chroma key. If there's a tree behind you, you're going to want to look into rotoscoping, which is going to be very time consuming depending on how much movement there is in the shot and how long the shot is. Best shortcuts to get around fast and an unnecessary windows. So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by unnecessary windows. Are you talking about like these here with like clicking these and you don't want to click those? All of these pretty much everything in davinci resolve you can make a keyboard shortcut for um and then you were also talking about zooming in and out of your timeline um, i use control and then uh next to the backspace there's a plus and minus you can zoom in and out that way and then i believe that these three here um also have keyboard or you can keyboard shortcuts these i haven't yet because it's kind of like a new thing i'm just so used to just zooming in and out like that um that's how i've done it in the past um but the windows 
yeah everything that you you can um shortcut so like here you can see like my shortcuts here um but i don't have i don't have anything in this navigation maybe active panels so like these here control seven let's see what happens control seven okay the control i guess would do that i personally don't use them so uh, yeah <laughs> So my next question is kind of talking about if I have something, if I have a fusion comp and I change something on it and then I come back to the edit page and then go back into fusion, it's empty. So what I think is going on here, it's let's add in a fusion comp and I'll drop this down here, right? I'm going to put my fusion comp down here, right? On my timeline. Maybe there's a ton of stuff on my timeline, but that's one of my elements on my timeline. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my media pool. So I'm going to come to my media pool. I'm going to double click on it because that's what I want to edit, right? And then once it's opened up in here, what I can start to do is now I can add stuff in, right? And we might be adding some other things in here. Let's just add that in. Let's view it. Okay. So now let's say we we've added all of that in now we come over to the edit page and now we have our our uh, fusion comp here we can see it's a comp right we have the little fusion thing because there's a live uh, fusion comp connected to that now we come into here and now we don't see anything but we edit it the fusion comp that we drug onto the timeline and this is where a lot of people don't really understand what's going on so whenever you bring something on the timeline it's an instance of itself on the timeline so I didn't explain this very well when I was initially filming this, but the idea here is that you're going to want to make sure once you're on the fusion page to open up your clips view and along the bottom, you're going to see all the clips that are currently on your timeline. You just want to make sure that the correct one is active before you start adding different adjustments into your uh, node tree. And then once you do that, then you'll be sure that your fusion comp that you're working on is on the correct node instead of trying to use a fusion comp that is in your media pool instead of one of the ones that are currently on the timeline i probably lost a lot of people explaining that but uh yeah with that being said i think that kind of concludes this one I'd stay safe guys and i'll talk to you guys in the next one have a good one guys